lithium. That's a wonder element, if there ever was one. Bipolar disorder, electronics, nuclear energy, lubricants. Not for people, lubricants. There's a lot of things we do with lithium, like a lot. But what is lithium? Lithium is a metal. If you had like pure lithium, like a block of lithium, incidentally, if you had this block of lithium, you probably have a fire on your hands because it's very, very reactive. And for this reason, when you find lithium in nature, you don't find the lithium metal. What you find are lithium salts, where the lithium has reacted and given away one of its electrons to become that oh so magical lithium ion. These ions find their way to like a carbonate or a chloride or a citrate or some other negatively charged anion, and they pair up and they make a salt. And it turns out a lot of those salts are very water soluble. Because lithium salts are so soluble, there's actually a lot of it in the ocean. It bubbles up from underground aquifers that dissolve these lithium salts. These naturally occurring springs of mineral water that have high concentrations of lithium in them actually have been around for, well, you know, probably as long as the earth's been around, right? And we've had the hydrological cycle. There are records of ancient Greeks even prescribing mineral waters from these springs that were known to have an effect on people's moods. They didn't know it was lithium. They just knew that these springs had effects on people's moods. So they would send people to go and drink water from these springs. But it wasn't until the 1800s, the beginning of the 19th century, I think exactly, where it was figured out that there's this mineral called petalite. And 20 years later, it was figured out that there's this new element in this mineral called petalite, and they decided to call that element lithium for stone because it came from a rock. Very creative, I know, it's, it's clever. So naturally, as you might imagine, after we figured out that there's this element lithium and it's around, people started trying to figure out, well, what's it in? Sometime between the 1820s and the 1880s, it was kind of figured out that these mineral springs that had these mood effects on people had lithium salts dissolved in them. And this gave rise to the boom of lithiated water, which ended up in all kinds of things. You could kind of probably think of it as like the alkaline water of its day, except there was historical precedence that these lithiated springs were helpful to the point where you had celebrities and rich people going to naturally occurring sources of this water. Like I think one was in Georgia, there are several around the world and they would bathe in the water and drink the water and bottle the water. And I guarantee you most of the bottled lithium water on the market at the time was like just regular tap water where they added lithium to it. It wasn't, wasn't the magic spring water. So pervasive was the use of lithia water that there eventually existed bib label lithiated lemon lime soda, which you might know as 7-Up, which originally had lithium in it, or at least lithiated water or lithium citrate, one of the salts of lithium. It's not still in there. It's not. It's It, it was banned. It was banned a while ago, like 1948. It's fine. So around that time, though, when it got banned, this Australian chemist was just straight wilding in a lab overseas. So here's what happened. At some point in his career, he became in charge of psychiatric patients, and he was very, very committed to trying to help them. So committed was he to trying to help them that he decided to take samples of their urine and analyzing it in a process that involved guinea pigs. We thank them for their sacrifice. But through these tests with the urine and the guinea pigs, he was able to figure out, according to him, that this urine from people with bipolar disorder was different from people who didn't have bipolar disorder. And this formed the basis of his testing. And so he went along through known compounds, trying to find something that would change this effect. And eventually he found lithium carbonate. And according to his results and how he did what he did, he figured out that this lithium carbonate made that urine toxicity less apparent. And that kind of was the start of using lithium as a psychiatric medicine. Now, modern science, with the lovely, lovely benefit of hindsight, looks at a lot of what he did, including testing lithium on himself, with a frowny face because it's not exactly good science. But did it answer the question? Did we find out something useful? Well then. Because of the dubious nature of Cade's methods, his publications were not widely respected or accepted. It wasn't until a few other notable chemists and scientists and doctors started also trying to analyze the effects of lithium in somewhat more controlled, rigorous 
less animal harmful ways. One notable Danish psychiatrist, Mogens, he is known for having published in The Lancet, a very big deal journal, the findings of a double blind placebo controlled study that formally showed that lithium does in fact have this effect. And from there on, it just kind of exploded in use as a treatment for psychiatric disorders in general, not even just bipolar disorder. It was one of the first things we had that worked that wasn't literally removing a section of someone's brain or frying their brain, like actual like electrodes frying their brain. We don't really know how or why lithium does what it does in the body, but we know it's generally beneficial. But at the same time, that does make it difficult to use it to treat things because it is also toxic at not super high levels. So now we're gonna turn this wheel because the other reason why lithium is interesting is because of the device that I'm doing this on, the battery in this phone, also in your computer, also in somebody's electric car, also and also and also. It's like everywhere. And the reasons why lithium can do what it does in your body and what it does in electronics are not necessarily related, but they kind of come from the same central source. And it has to do with how small lithium is. The reason why this lithium cation is also special is because it wants to be that cation. So I'm going to need you to remember back. Atoms are made of protons, neutrons in the middle, and then electrons on the outside. And these electrons are held here by the protons in the middle. Lithium's protons are good to just give up one of those electrons. They don't, they don't need it. They're happy to just like keep their little shell and it's very, it's very stable in that way. It's more stable that way than it is if it has that extra electron. This is why lithium metal is so reactive. But lithium salts will just hang out in nature until you know we dig them up and put them in a cell phone. So now, with what I just said, that lithium is happy to get rid of that electron. That means it doesn't take a lot of energy to get that electron out of there. In fact, you get energy from the lithium atom when you take that electron away. It's so happy to get rid of it. It's like, I'll pay you to take it. Just, just take it. And that's kind of the basis for your battery. Add to it that lithium is, you know, one of the lightest solid materials in existence. And this makes for really lightweight, really high energy density batteries. So good is lithium at this battery thing. There are some who think that batteries aren't going to get much better than this until we maybe find some other special super high end material because for the qualities that you need, something that gives you it gives you a lot of energy per unit material and you know, you get a lot of unit material in a small amount of mass, lithium is kind of the best we got. But this is by all means not the exhaustive list of uses for lithium. It also found, finds uses in making special industrial lubricants for like jet engines because the oils that you can make from lithium burn at insanely high temperatures. It's used in nuclear chemistry for like weapons and also for making various isotopes of other elements like they use it to make tritium. I use it as a chemist in organometallic reactions with literal bottles of liquid fire. You can look up methyl lithium. It's not fun. It's useful, it's not fun. Fireworks, air purification, ceramics. We use it for a lot, we use it for a lot. And incidentally, this is becoming a bit of an issue because the mining and processing of lithium is not exactly environmentally friendly. To be fair, most extractive processes under capitalism are not gonna be environmentally friendly, but Doing it with lithium is particularly rough because of how big the demand is and how small an amount there is to be extracted from its sources. Because remember, lithium is kind of rare. It's not formed in stars the way other elements are. It, it kind of has to come from elsewhere, like supernova explosions and cosmic ray spoliation. There's only a very small percentage of it, even in the vast amount of water that you might collect and evaporate to get the salts out of. So it's a very energy intensive process. It's a very materials intensive process and it's not great for the environment. So, you know, suffice to say, it is one of those elements that did absolutely revolutionize humanity in two different ways. And that is kind of cool. Hopefully we can find something to replace it sometime in the near future, or I don't know, maybe we can mine it from space or something. That'd be cool. But until next time, it's Kim Thug.